Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. Package managers have been an incredible tool for leveraging other libraries and frameworks to be included in your own products or projects. What's been largely lost, however, is the discussion around decision making and the implications of even taking on a dependency. So before you do that quick NPM installer update, let me talk about some of the things you should be considering. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. The theme of this video really is that you need to own your dependencies. You need to take ownership over that decision-making process and understand the consequences and considerations. Dependencies are nothing more than an extension of your own code. So if you're taking time to consider how you're own, writing your own code, you should be doing the same about determining how you're taking a dependency, what you're taking a dependency on, and whether you should even take a dependency. So the first question is, do you trust the authors or people publishing that package? Do you trust them? Do you trust that dependency? I say that because seemingly every few months for a variety of reasons, in this particular case, it's a developer that pushed an update that was corrupt, that caused an infinite loop, and then basically breaking everybody that updated to that new version. So again, do you trust that dependency? Now this doesn't matter whether it's open source, closed source, commercial, free. That's really not necessarily a part of it, although it does play a factor in terms of are the, it's the package that you're depending on, is it secure in terms of the actual code? But it's also as well as the keys and everything involved in actually publishing that to whatever package manager. Are they responsive in terms of support? Do you need support? Just because it's open, so, uh, open source doesn't mean there's not paid support on top of things. What's the health of the project? If it's open source, are there multiple contributors? If it's something closed source or even open source that is a company has behind for support, how long has that company been around? How long has the actual project or dependency that you're taking uh, on been around? So there's a lot of considerations here because are you taking on something if you do not trust them? And what's the, the impact if any of these things go wrong? What happens if you need support and you can't get it? What happens if the, uh, the actual, that actual dependency just ceases to exist and there's no more updates to it. And there's some security fixes. Is it closed source? Is it open source? Can you fork it? In terms of security, again, do you trust that whatever keys are available to push updates are secured? Do you trust that, like in that example, that somebody's not gonna push out an update um, that has intentionally broken you? So again, do you trust that dependency? Next comes really communication and expectations. So to talk about this, there's another post again from uh, very, very recently where it was a routine gem update ended up in creating 74,000 worth of subscriptions. Basically this post explains what ultimately happened, which was the did a gem update for a bunch of different packages. And one of the packages had a behavior change. Now they're using semantic versioning, right? So all of this should have been fixed by semantic versioning. Semantic versioning is good at communicating to humans that something changed. And the example I just illustrated with that package, that gem, is it was a minor update. And the consumers, the people taking on that dependency, just assumed, oh, it's no breaking change, but it actually was a behavioral change that caused this. Again, semantic versioning at, yes, while it can indicate um, what the intent or hope was of the publishers, of the creators, that's not to say they're gonna get it right. What happens if there's a bug in the package that you realize exists and there's no update for it yet, so you create a workaround. Then they publish an update that has a patch update and you realize, okay, shouldn't break me, but it actually does because of your workaround. Well, it was a breaking change to you. So under no circumstance can you just really kind of lose sight of the versioning if people are using semantic versioning and just assume that because it's a patch or minor update, that it won't be a breaking change to you. So my recommendation almost all the time is to pin versions or a lock file to guarantee that you know what version you're actually using. Don't rely on ranges so you can automatically get a minor or a patch update. I get the reasons why. Most often it's claimed for security. If there's a patch update, you're immediately getting it. But again, this goes back to, is it gonna be breaking? 
if you're keeping on top of your packages and <laughs> making sure that you don't wildly have an insane amount of dependencies, it's much more manageable to be looking at your dependencies and every package manager basically has it to see what versions you're out, um, what are outdated, so that you can update them and then realize whatever tests that you have, what other manual testing you have to make sure that you keep up to date and that they're not breaking you. So the last thing to talk about here is context because context is a king and it matters on how you make these decisions. So first, it is the context of where you're taking the pension. Are we talking about a product that you're developing that has the life expectancy of years and years and years? Uh, let's say it's like 10 years plus then how you choose to take on dependencies because they're gonna live within that project likely for a very long time, you want them to have a good life as well so that you can keep updating with them so that they're getting feature updates, uh, that, so that they're fixing bugs. But if you're developing a product or a project that is only has a life expectancy of a year or a couple years, well, are you concerned as much about um, feature enhancements if you're not gonna be developing that project or product in two years? So again, context matters on what you're actually building. And then to that is the size. I talk about this a lot in terms of boundaries is that you want to limit what the kind of the scope is or the size of where you're taking dependencies. Because especially again, if something's long lived, you may need to swap out dependencies. You may need to change dependencies for a variety of reasons. They could be business decisions. They may be because of technical ones, like we were mentioning at the very beginning, in terms of something not being maintained anymore, you need to replace it. And with that comes, like I talk about in a ton of videos, is coupling. How you couple to a dependency is also a very big decision. But if you're limiting it within a particular boundary, at least you're kind of narrowing its usage, its scope within a boundary so that it's easier to change. Whether you choose to abstract your dependencies, whether you realize what the cost of that abstraction is, is it worth it, is it not? But again, no matter what, is realize your usage upon that dependency, how important that dependency is to you, and how coupled you are to it. You're not gonna build everything, nor should you. You're gonna leverage third-party dependencies that fill a void that a library or a framework do that allows you to focus on application code. Again, this makes sense. But the context of how you're using that uh, dependency in the given context of your project or product and how long it's living. If you have something that's gonna be expected to be used for many, many years and developed through that life cycle of that product, the dependencies that you take on, you likely want to have some updates to them, feature changes so that you can grow along with them and leverage their new features and advance the, what you're actually building. So there's different considerations in terms of the security, the health of that dependency, uh, support. Those are all different considerations. If you're developing something for the now that maybe has a very short lifespan or expected lifespan, then maybe you don't have those different concerns. Same thing goes with coupling. How big of a system are you building? You want to limit that coupling uh, in different boundaries or understand that maybe you want to create your own abstraction over some dependencies. Maybe the cost is way too high because it's very critical to you. Again, there's a lot of considerations and I hope we, hopefully I've covered a bunch of different things that you should be thinking about. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.